Cube Studios in Palo Alto and Boston, connecting with thought leaders all around the world. This is a Cube Conversation. Hi, everybody. This is Dave Vellante, and welcome to the special Cube Conversation. I first met Frank Slootman in 2007 when he was the CEO of Data Domain. Back then, he was a CEO of a disruptive company and still is. Data Domain, believe it or not, back then was actually replacing tape drives as the primary mechanism for backup. Yes, believe it or not, it used to be tape. Fast forward several years later, I met Frank uh, again at VMworld when he had become the CEO of ServiceNow. At the time, ServiceNow was a small company, about 100 plus million dollars. Frank and his team took that company to 1.2 billion. And Gartner at the time of the IPO said, you know, this doesn't make sense. It's a small market. It's a, it's a very narrow help desk market. It's maybe a couple billion dollars. The vision of Slootman and his team was to really expand the total available market and execute like a laser, which they did. And today ServiceNow, a very, very successful company. Snowflake first came into my line of sight in 2015 when SiliconANGLE wrote an article of why Snowflake is better than Amazon Redshift, reimagining data. Well, last year, Frank Slootman joined Snowflake, another disruptive company, and he's here today to talk about how Snowflake is really participating in this COVID-19 crisis and really want to share some of Frank's insights and leadership principles. Frank, great to see you. Thanks for coming on. Yes, thanks for having us, Dave. So when I first reported uh, earlier uh, this year on Snowflake and shared some data with the community, you, you reached back out to me and said, Dave, I want to just share with you, I am not a playbook CEO, I am a situational CEO. This is what I learned in the military. So Frank, this COVID-19 situation was thrown at you. It's a kind of, it's a black swan. What was your first move as a leader? Well, um, what, what the, my first move is let's not overreact, you know, take a deep breath. Um, you know, let's really examine what we know. Uh, let's not jump to conclusions. Let's not try to project things that we're not capable of projecting. Um, that's hard because, you know, we tend to have, you know, sort of levels of, 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 of certainty uh, about what's going to happen in the next week and the next month and so on. And all of a sudden this, that's out of the window. Creates enormous anxiety uh, with people. So in other words, you got to sort of reset to, okay, you know, what do we know? What can we do? What do we control? Um, and and not let our minds sort of you know go out of control. So um, I talk to our people all the time about maintain a sense of normalcy. You know, focus on the work, stay in the stay in the moment. And uh, by the way, turn the news feed off, right? Because the hysteria you get fed through the through the media is really not helpful, right? So uh, just 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 cool down and you know focus on what we still can do. Um, and then you know I, I think then everybody takes a deep breath and. We just go back to work. I mean, we're in this mode now for for three weeks, and I can tell you, I'm on uh, I'm on teleconferencing calls, you know, whatever, eight nine hours a day, prospects, customers, all over the world. Um, pretty much what I was doing before, except I'm not traveling right now. Yeah, you know, so, so it sounds not, very, not that different than what it was before. <laughs> it sounds very Bill Belichickian, you know, to focus on those yeah. things at which you can control. When when you were um, running ServiceNow, I really learned from you, and of course Mike Scarpelli, your 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 then and current CFO, about the importance of transparency. And I, I'm interested in in how you're communicating. It sounds like you're doing some very similar things, but if you change the way in which you've communicated to your team, your internal employees, and all. Uh, we're communicating much more um, because we can no longer rely on, you know, sort of the running into people here, there, and everywhere. So we have to be much more purposeful about communications. Now, for example, I mean, I sent an email out to the entire company on Monday morning, you know, and it's kind of a, you know, bunch of anecdotes just to bring the, the connection back, uh, the normalcy. Uh, you know, it, it it just helps people, you know, get connected back to the mothership and like, well, you know, things are still going on, you know, we're still talking in the way we always used to be. Um, that really helps. And I also, you know, uh, check in with people a lot more. I ask all of our uh, leadership to constantly check in with people uh, because you can't assume that everybody is is okay. You can't be out of sight, out of mind. So we need to be more purposeful in reaching out and communicating with people than we were previously. I mean, a lot. A lot of people are obviously concerned about their jobs. Have you sort of communicated, what have you communicated to employees about, about layoffs? I mean, you guys just did a, a, a large raise just before all this, your timing was kind of impeccable, but what have you communicated in that regard? Um, you know, I've said there's no layoffs uh, on our radar, number one. Number two, uh, we are hiring. 
Uh, and number three is, um, you know, we have a higher level of scrutiny on the hires that we're making. Um, and I, I am very transparent. Uh, in other words, I tell people, look, you know, I prioritize the roles that are closest to the drive train of the business, right? It's kind of common sense, but, you know, I wanted to make sure that this is how we're, we're thinking about it. There's, there are some roles that are more postponable than others. Uh, I'm hiring in engineering uh, without any reservation because that is the long-term, uh, you know, strategic interest um, you know, of the company. On the sales side, I want to, I want to know that sales leaders, you know, know how to convert to yield, right? That we're not just sort of, you know, bringing capacity online and the leadership, uh, you know, is not convinced or confident that they, uh, they can convert to yield. So there's a little, little bit, uh, you know, finer uh, level of scrutiny on the hiring. But by and large, you know, it's not that different. Uh, you know, there, there's this, this saying uh, out there that, you know, we, we should suspend all uh, non-essential spending and hiring. I'm like, you should always do that, <laughs> right? I mean, what's, what's different today? <laughs> if it's non-essential, why do it, right? So, um, so all of this comes back to, you know, this is how we probably should operate anyways. You know? I want to talk a little bit about the tech uh, behind Snowflake. I'm, I'm very sensitive when CEOs come on my program to, to make sure that we're not, you know, out, I'm, I'm not trying to bait CEOs into, you know, ambulance chasing. That's not what this is about. But I do want to share with our community kind of what's new, what's changed, and how companies like Snowflake are participating in this crisis. And in particular, uh, we've been reporting for a while, if you guys bring up that first slide, that you know, the, the innovation in the industry is really no longer about uh, Moore's law. Uh, you know, it's really shifted. Uh, there's a new, what we call an innovation cocktail in the business. And it's, we've collected all this data over the last 10, 10 years, you know, with, the, with Hadoop and other distributed data. Now we have edge data, et cetera. There's this huge trove of data. And now, AI is becoming real, it's becoming much more economical. So applying machine intelligence to this data and then the cloud allows us to do this at scale, it allows us to bring in more data sources, it brings an agility in. So I wonder if you could talk about sort of this premise and how you guys fit. Yeah, I, I would start off by, by, by reordering the sequence and saying, you know, cloud's number one, uh, that is foundational, that, that helps us uh, bring scale to data that we never had. And number two, it helps us bring uh, computational power to data uh, at, at levels we've never had before. And, and that just means that that queries and workloads can complete uh, orders of magnitude faster than they ever could before. And that introduces concepts like the time value of data, right? The faster you get it, the more impactful and powerful uh, it is. Uh, I do agree, I, I view AI uh, sort of next generation of, of of analytics. You know, instead of using data to in, to inform people, you know, we're using data to uh, to drive processes and business directly, right? So I'm I, uh, I'm I'm agreeing with obviously with these trends because we're we're the we're the principal um, you know uh, beneficiaries and and drivers of these uh, these platforms. Well, when we talked about uh, earlier this year about um, a snowflake. We really brought up the notion that you guys uh, were one of the first, if not the first, uh, and guys, big, bring back Frank, I, I got to see him. Um, one of the <laughs> first to really sort of separate the notion of, of being able to scale compute independent of, of storage. And that brought not only economics, but it brought flexibility. So you've got this cloud native database. Again, what caught my attention in that Redshift article that we wrote is essentially for our audience, Redshift was based on Par Excel. Amazon did a great job of really sort of making that a, a cloud database, but it really wasn't born in the cloud and that's sort of the, the advantage of, of Snowflake. So that architectural uh, approach is starting to really you know, take hold. So I want to give, give an example. Guys, if you bring up the next, next chart, this is a, an example of, of, a, of, a, of a system that I've been using since the early January when I saw this you know, COVID come out. Somebody texted me this and it's the John Hopkins data set. It's, it's awesome. It shows you, the, you know, around the map, you can follow it. It's, it's pretty close to real time and, uh, and, and it's quite good. Um, but the problem is, I right, thank you guys. The problem is that when I started to look at, I wanted to get into sort of a more granular view of the counties and I couldn't do that. Um, so guys bring up the next slide if you would. So what, what I did was I, I searched around and I found a New York Times uh, a GitHub uh, data instance. And you can see it on the top left here. It basically, it was a CSV and notice what it says. It says we can't make this file beautiful and searchable because it's, it's essentially too big. Uh, and then I ran into what you guys are doing with Star Schema. Star Schema is a data company. Um, and, and essentially, 
you guys made the the notion that look the john hopkins data set as great as it is it's not just sort of ready for analytics it's got to be cleaned uh etc and so i want you to talk about that uh, a little bit guys if you could bring frank back and share with us what's what you guys have done with star schema and how that's helping understand covid-19 and its progression yeah, one of the really cool concepts, uh, you know, I, I I felt, you know, about Snowflake is what we call the data sharing um, architecture. Uh, and what that really means is that, you know, if you and I both have Snowflake accounts, even though we work for different uh, institutions, um, you know, we can, uh, you know, share data objects, tables, schema, whatever they are with each other. And you can process against that in place as, as if they are uh, you know, residing in a local to your own platform. We have taken that uh, that concept uh, from private also to public, so that data providers like Star Schema, you know, can list their data sets because they're a data company. So obviously, that, that it's in their business interest to to allow this data to be uh, to be profiled and to be accessible by the by the Snowflake community. And they and this data is is what we call analytics ready. It is instantly accessible. It is also continually uh, updated. You have to do nothing. Uh, it's augmented with with incremental data, and then you know our our Snowflake users can just combine this data with supply chain, with economic data, with internal operating data, and so on. And we got a very strong reaction from from our customer base because they're like, man, you're, you're saving us weeks, if not months, just just getting prepared to start to do an L, let, let alone doing it, right? Uh, because the data is analytics ready, and they have to do literally nothing. I mean, if they, in other words, if they ask us for it in, in the morning. In the afternoon, they'll be running workloads against it, right? And combining it with their own data. Yeah, so I, I point out that, that New York Times GitHub uh, data set that I showed you, it's a couple of days behind. Uh, we're talking here about re near real time or you know, as close as real time as you can get. Is that right? Yep. Yeah, it's every day gets updated. So the other thing, one of the things we've been reporting, and Frank, I wonder if you can comment on this, is this is new emerging workloads in the cloud. We've been reporting on this for a couple of years. You know, the first generation of cloud was IaaS. It was really about compute, storage, some database infrastructure, but really now what we're seeing is these analytic data stores where the, the valuable data is, is sitting and much of it is in the cloud and bringing machine intelligence and data science capabilities to that to allow for this real time or near real time analysis and that is a new emerging workload that is really gaining a lot of steam as these companies try to go to this so-called digital transformation uh, your your comments on that yeah we refer to that as, as the emergence or the rise of the data cloud um, you know if you look at the cloud landscape uh, we're all very familiar with the infrastructure clouds you know aws and, and azure and, and and gcp and so on it's, it's just massive storage and servers and uh, obviously there's, there's data locked into those infrastructure clouds as well. Uh, we've been familiar for it for 10, 20 years now with, with application clouds, you know, notably Salesforce, but obviously, you know, Workday, ServiceNow, SAP, uh, and so on. They also have data in that, right? But now you're seeing that, you know, people are unsiloing the data. And this is super important because as long as the data is locked in these infrastructure cloud, in these application clouds, we can do the things that we need to do with it, right? We, we have to unsilo it to allow the scale of, of, of querying and, and execution against that data. And you don't see that any more clear than you do right now uh, during this, this meltdown that we're experiencing. Okay, so I learned long ago, Frank, not to argue with you, but I want to push you on something. <laughs> um, so I'm not trying to be argumentative, but one of those silos is on-prem. I've, I've heard you talk about, look, we're a cloud company. We're cloud first, we're cloud only. We're not going to do an on-prem version, but some of that data lives on-prem. There are companies out there that are saying, hey, we separate compute and storage too, we run in the cloud, but we also run on-prem, that's our big differentiator. Um, your thoughts on that? Yeah, we uh, we burnt the ship behind us, okay? Uh, we're, we're not doing this endless hedging that people have done for 20 years, you know, sort of keeping you know, a leg in, in both worlds. Forget it, this will only work in the public cloud because it's, this is how the utility model works, right? Um, I, I, think, I think everybody is coming to this realization, right? I mean, the excuses are, are, are running out at this point. Um, you know, we, we think that uh, it'll, people will come to the public cloud a lot sooner than we will ever come to the private cloud. It's not that we can't run a private cloud, it just diminishes the, uh, the potential and the value that we, that we bring. 
So as I sort of mentioned in my intro, you got, you have always been at the forefront of disruption. And you think about digital transformation, you know, Frank, we go to all these events, we used to be physical, now we're doing, you know, the Cube Digital. Um, and, and so everybody talks about digital transformation. CEOs get up, they talk about how they're helping their customers, you know, move to, to digital. But the reality is, is when you actually talk to businesses, there was a lot of complacency. Of, hey, you know, this isn't really going to happen in my lifetime, or we're doing pretty well, or maybe the CEO might be committed, but it doesn't necessarily trickle down to the P&L managers who have a nut day. One of the things that we've been talking about is COVID-19 is going to accelerate that digital transformation and make it a mandate. You're sort of, you're, you're seeing it obviously in retail play out uh, in a number of other industries, supply chains are, are, you know, this is wreaked havoc on supply chains. And so there's going to be a rethinking what are your thoughts on the acceleration of, of digital transformation? Well, uh, obviously, this is the, the, the crisis that we're experiencing is obviously an enormous catalyst for, for digital transformation and everything that that entails uh, and, and what that means. I think we, you know, as, a, as, an, as an industry, we're just victims of inertia, right? I mean, I, I haven't understood for, for 20 years why, why education, both, both K through 12, but also higher ed, you know, why, why they're so brick and mortar bound, you know, on the way they're doing things, right? We could massively scale and drop the cost of education, uh, you know, by, by going digital and now we're forced into it and everybody's like, wow, this is not bad. You're right, that it, it, it isn't, right? But we haven't. So the economics, you know, the economic imperative hasn't really set in, but it is now. Um, so these are all great things. You know, having said that, you know, there are also limits to, to digital transformation and now I'm sort of experiencing that right now, you know, being on, on, on video calls all day and oftentimes with people I've never met before, right? There, there, there's still a barrier there, right? It's not like digital can replace absolutely everything. And that, that, that is just not true, right? I mean, there's, there's, there's some level of filter that just doesn't happen when, you know, when, you're, when you're digital. So there's still you know, a need for, for people to be uh, in, in the same place. I don't want to sort of over rotate on, on, on this concept. And they're like, okay, from here on out, you know, we're all going to be on the wire. Is that that's not the way it will be? Yeah, be balanced. So earlier you made a comment that look, well, we should never be spending on non-essential items. And so you've seen, <laughs> you know, back in two thousand eight, you saw, you know, the rest in peace, good times. You've seen, you know, the Black Swan memos that go out. I I, I assume that. I mean, you're a very successful investor as well. You've done a couple of stints in the VC community. What are you seeing in the Valley with regard to investments? You know, will investments you know continue? Will we continue to to feed innovation? What's your sense of that? Well, this is this is another wake up call. Um, you know, because you know in, in Silicon Valley, there's way too much money. Um, there's certainly a lot of ideas, but there's not a lot of people that can that can execute on it. So, um, what happens is you know a lot of things get funded, uh, and the execution is either you know no good or or it's it's just it's just not a, a valid opportunity. And when you go through a downturn like this. You know, you're you're finding out that uh, you know uh, th those those businesses are not going to make it. I mean, when the tide is running out, you know, only the strongest players, um, you know, are, are are going to survive that. Uh, it's almost a, a you know a natural you know selection you know process that happens from from time to time. It's not necessarily a bad thing because people get reallocated. I mean, Silicon Valley is basically one giant beehive, right? I mean, we're constantly repurposing money and people and talent uh, and so on. And that's actually good because if, if, if an idea is not worth investing in, let's, let's not do it. Let's, let's repurpose those resources in places where it, where it has merit, where it has viability. No. Well, Frank, I want to thank you for coming on. Look, I mean, you don't have to do this. You know, you could have retired long, long ago, but having leaders like you in place in these times of crisis, but, but even when in, in good times to lead companies, inspire people, and, and we really appreciate what you do uh, for companies, for your employees, uh, for your customers, and, and certainly for our community. So thanks again, I really appreciate it. Happy to do it, thanks Dave. All right, and thank you for watching everybody. Dave Vellante for theCUBE. We will see you next time.